Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Well, it is awesome to be here today. I actually, I, I paused there because I was waiting for someone to translate. I have not preached without a translator for probably five or six years. So wow, this is, this is good. I can probably say twice as much in the same amount of time. So I actually grew up in this church. I have three kids here today who now serve with us in our church. They help lead worship just like I did, like, I don't know, 20 years ago here at this church. Was it 20 years? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's scary. So, yeah, it's really cool to be back here, and it is really an honor to be able to share with you all today. So when Pastor Destin asked me if I would share about Mary, I thought, oh, that's perfect because um, there is something about the story of Mary that's really um, helped me in my life so much. And so I just want to share that with you today. So I'm going to start by reading in Luke 1, verse 26 to 29, and I think we have the slide for that. It says, in the sixth month of, month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village named Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. So the title of my message today is Confused and Disturbed. <laughs> it, it doesn't sound very uplifting, but we'll see. We'll pull that apart a little bit as we go along. Let's just open in prayer really quickly before I start. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence today. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your word. God, we know that your word does not return void. So as we, re as we read your word, God, it reads us. And you bring revelation to us through it. So I pray you would do that today, that you would touch each one of our hearts in Jesus' name. So here we have Mary. She's a very normal woman from a normal Jewish family engaged to a very normal man. Everything about her, nothing is really outstanding. Um, she's just average. She's most likely poor. Um, really, she doesn't have many cares in the world. And so an angel of the Lord, as we read in that first scripture, an angel of the Lord comes to her and says, greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. And so here's Mary. She's thinking, who are you calling a favored woman? I'm really nobody. So why are you calling me highly favored? There's nothing about me that is highly favored. But something we learn about God is that God actually sees us by the identity that he gave us, not by our own perspective. So Mary's thinking, I'm nothing special. I'm, I'm just Mary, and God is like, no, you're highly favored. So he's speaking to her identity, and he says, the Lord is with you. She's thinking, the Lord is with me? Why? Why me? Why, Why would God be with me? Why do I need that? How? Is, is, did you make some kind of a mistake? Is, is the angel coming to the wrong person? Then we continue reading in um, verse 30. The angel says, don't be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. So, put yourself in her shoes. If an angel came to you today and showed up in front of you and said, you have found favor with God, can you, can you kind of imagine what's going to come next? An angel telling you you're favored. You're like, a favor? Okay, I'll take a favor. You know, like, is it going to be some kind of reward or blessing? Um, kind of. <laughs> so we read in, in verse 31 to 33, the angel continues, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and we will be called the son of the most high God. 
The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. So when you put yourself in her shoes, she's like, I'm going to get a favor. <laughs> well, she didn't understand what on earth was going on. But uh, the first passage we read said that she was confused and disturbed. And, and then when the angel comes to her and says, I'm going to, you're favored. He gives her this piece of information that is like, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense at all. I'm going to conceive and give birth to a child? Like, how is that a favor? <laughs> that, that's not helpful to me. And then in, in verse 34, Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? Because I'm still a virgin. It's like, what you're saying doesn't make any sense. I've tried to process this and come to the conclusion, this makes no sense. Like, I, you called me favored, you called me all this, but I think you're forgetting who I am. Because, first of all, I'm a virgin. None of this is even possible. It doesn't add up. And I think in our own lives, we find ourselves doing that to God quite often. I know I do, all the time. It's like, yeah, but God, don't you see why this isn't really possible? <laughs> don't you see, God, why this isn't really you know, the best way to do things? You know, I don't see, God, how this is favoring me. <laughs> and then the angel confirms his word in, in, in verse number 35. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. Sometimes... What God puts in our hands is not what we would consider a blessing. Is that true? Sometimes what God puts in our hands is not what we look at and say, oh, I am blessed. <laughs> We're like, what is this? Like, you call me favored, but what is this? You know, look at Mary's life. Look what she had to risk. In fact, her very life was at stake through this because if she was to commit adultery, she was in line for a stoning. I mean, she could have been stoned. It would have been if her fiancé took her, you know, to the authorities and said, she's pregnant and she was engaged to me. I, that's not allowed. <laughs> so her life was at stake. Now, why would God do that? Why would God dare do something? that put his favorite daughter's life at stake. Could it be that something that is designed and crafted in the perfect will of God could confuse and maybe even disturb us? You know, it can be so easy to look at everything in the present day and say, this is not good. This is not good. I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask for this. And, and you could say the classic, why me? Why me? Like, this is not God. <laughs> it's easy to look at something and do that. But with God, all things are possible. And that's what, that's what the angel told Mary. With God, all things are possible. It may look like an impossibility to you. It may not really appear to be a blessing to you. But with God... All things are possible. So many stories of heroes in the Bible begin with God asking a normal human being to step out into something that's impossible. In all, as from God asking normal humans to step into something that looks like a failure. Looks like that is going to end terribly. But how come so many stories end up like the heroes of the Bible? It's because with God, all things are possible. And when God asks you and, and puts that on you to step out into something that looks impossible, the thing that happens next is always a result of your response to that. How are you going to respond when God gives you something really difficult and confusing, 
Wh- wh- how do we respond to that? Well, let's look at Mary's response in verse 38. Mary responds, I am the Lord's servant. <laughs> May everything that you have said about me come true. How many of you would have responded that way? <laughs> I'm not sure that I have what it takes to respond that way. Yes, I'm the Lord's servant. Make, you know, put a baby in my womb. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm married and I don't even know if I could accept that anymore. <laughs> I'm like, no, God, this is the way it is. I, I've already planned this. I've had enough. And here she is responding, I'm the Lord's servant. Every, may everything you have said about me come true. That's next level, guys. That's next level. May it come true. I think I would pray a little bit more like, if I have to, God, I'm willing. You know, like, I'm not. I mean, her response blows me away. The fact that it could turn her life upside down. And she's just like, you know what? It's you. I'm willing. She had a question. She said, how can this be? And then when the angel confirmed, she said, you know what? Let it be. <laughs> that, that is next level living in submission to God. That's humility. Humility. You know, hum- being, being humble doesn't mean thinking small. <laughs> being humble is saying, okay, I am who you say I am, not who I say I am. And that's exactly what she did. You know, I, I get so tired of people thinking being humble means you have to be unsuccessful. Or being humble means you have to be poor. It's like, no, you, mu- you c- being humble and Saying to, your, saying to the Lord, you know, use me, I am who you say I am, may launch you into one of, you know, whoever God has called you to be. I don't know who that is. You, you may be in a, in a less visible role, but God may put you into a very visible spot where people look at you and say, oh, you know, <laughs> I've heard people say, oh, you must have committed some sin. That, you know, he, he has this much money. They must be compromising. But what if God, when you submit yourself to him and say, let, you know, do what you will in my life. God can do anything from that moment. And humility is allowing that to happen. You know, Mary's response ultimately was just an act of surrendering herself to the call of God on her life. She was saying, yes, I will to the hardest thing that she was being asked to walk through. And it was very hard. If you can think about Mary's walk, it didn't become any easier once, once you know, she had Jesus. I mean, she lived, she carried that her whole life. It wasn't easy. It was God, but it wasn't easy. You know, God didn't, but, but what we're going to look at now is that God didn't just put this problem and this hurdle in her path without actually preparing the way ahead. So sometimes God will give us something and we're like, that doesn't feel like a blessing. But what we have to understand is when we surrender, things start to fall in place very quickly. And let's look, let, let's look at what happened with Mary. Um... Immediately, what we see is immediately after the angel delivered the news to her that God had chosen her, God actually gave her an ally. God gave her a friend very, very quickly. And we read in verse 36, the angel continues speaking and says, What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren. But she has conceived a son and now is in her sixth month. So the angel is saying, okay, here's this heavy calling. (laughs) You may not have wanted it, but you have now submitted to it. But I'm not going to make you walk this alone. There's somebody you can go to. You're not, God's not going to give you something and say, okay, now go ahead. You know, you got this, now just go. He actually provides people and circumstances that will help you go through whatever he's calling you to. And so up until this point in Mary's life, it took 100% faith to believe that everything would work out. 
Because in, in logic, if she was using logic, it's not going to work out. Nothing's going to work out. Best case scenario, Joseph finds out she's pregnant and, and everything's ruined. It's like, you're ruining my life, God, but okay, whatever. I just have to trust you that if you gave this to me, somehow you're going to make it work. And so we read in verse 39 and 41, a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leapt within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. That is so profound that that happened. You know, there are people in our lives who God has placed specifically to help us walk this journey. And when Mary came face to face with something that she thought was impossible, she came face to face with this big confusion, this big, I don't know what to do. The very first thing we read in that verse is that Mary hurried. It says Mary hurried to the hill country. When you're faced with the impossible, who do you need to hurry to? Because sometimes when you wait, it is not good for you. Because sometimes God gives you something, but you're not supposed to carry that alone. We're supposed to do things in community. And sometimes when, when God gives you something, it's not that the whole world needs to know. But somebody, you need to have community. You need to have someone you can go to and say, I know this sounds crazy, but I knew you'd believe me. <laughs> and that's what happened here. This is crazy. But the moment she stepped into, the moment she stepped into Elizabeth's house, somehow Elizabeth already knew. You know, there are people who care about you, people who believe in you, and people who will fill you with encouragement. And those people are who are going to give you the strength to push through. And it's in this time of confusion for Mary that God uses Elizabeth to actually confirm his word that God had spoken to Mary. You know, when you're pregnant, okay, so all of you who have been pregnant will know this. You, there are times you do not feel pregnant. You're like, I know the test said I was pregnant, but maybe I should test again because I don't feel like it is. And so Mary could have been like, I don't really know what that was. Was that a bad dream? Like, was that a bad dream? Did I, did I think this up? <laughs> and, and right at the beginning of pregnancy, nobody would have known. There's no physical sign somehow that you're pregnant. You could have hidden it for a long time. But uh, we read in, in Luke, four, Luke 1 verse 42 and 45, it says, Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he had said. It was such a blessing to Mary at that moment that somebody, without her trying to explain herself, can you imagine trying to explain that to somebody? She didn't have to because the Holy Spirit had already prepared the way. The moment Mary stepped into the house of Elizabeth, Elizabeth knew. Nobody had to tell Elizabeth. So the Holy Spirit had already worked ahead, said, go to Elizabeth. Go to this person who's going who's gonna to be able to fill you with life. This person you're going to be able to share with. And God went ahead and, and organized it so that she knew. The baby in her womb jumped for joy. And she just prophesied what the angel had already said. So even if Mary was having doubts, I, I don't know what it's like. God just confirmed it to her then. This is not a curse. This is a blessing. And you've been chosen. This is not a big problem for you. This is the blessing of the Lord. This is the favor of God. It, if to outside eyes, it might not look that way, but the Holy Spirit spoke through Elizabeth 
and just confirm that to Mary. And when you're facing things that are bigger than you, make sure that you surround yourself with people who will build you up and also will confirm the word that God has spoken to you. People who will confirm that God is still using you. This situation, it's not a curse. God is working. God is moving. It will be like fuel to your spirit. Whenever you face difficult times, it's always easy to find people who will complain with you. So easy. But don't do it because sympathy is never going to see you through. You don't want to find somebody who's just sympathetic to you. It doesn't help. Like if, if I'm in a challenging situation and I have to choose, I want sympathy or I want the hard truth. Just go for the hard truth because in the end, it's going to get you a lot further. Somebody who will confirm what God says to you, not say, oh, I'm so sorry that this is happening to you, Mary. No, this is a blessing, Mary. This is, you are blessed above all women. And Elizabeth says, you're blessed because you believed what the Lord, you believed that the Lord would do what he said. You're blessed because you just simply believed. We need to choose to believe that God is doing something in our situation. Blessing comes when we choose to believe there's a blessing in here. I, I don't necessarily see it, but there's a blessing. You can even go as far as saying, I am blessed beyond all women. <laughs> I am blessed beyond all men. God is blessing me no matter what I'm seeing with my eyes. You know, whether it was a curse or a blessing, relied completely on Mary's perception. It was neither. She had to choose, is this a blessing or is this a curse? You, how am I going to look at this? Because she could have looked at it either way. And we also can. Consider what's in front of you. Consider the hurdles you face. How do you look at them? Do you see God working? Is that what you choose to see? Can you picture somehow a blessing is being formed? And maybe we can't see it exactly. You know, when we look at the story of Mary, it's so easy for us to call her blessed because we know the whole story. We know the big picture. But she wasn't there. She had to choose to look at it that way. And I wonder, for me, I wonder how long it took her to gain the courage to tell Joseph because, like I said, when it's brand new, you can hide it. You don't have to say anything right away. But this could have really ruined her life. This could have been the end of her. So we read in, in Matthew, we're going to go over to Matthew. Matthew 1, verse 19, it says, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. So we read this verse, and if it stopped here, now God really did ruin everything for Mary. Maybe she wasn't stoned, okay? But it still set her up for a terrible future. A, a single mother in, in those days? I mean, it's difficult to be a single mother now. Can you imagine in those days? And she would have, you know, she, at this point, if we read only this verse, you might think, you know, so much for highly favored. <laughs> so much for highly favored. But yet God was still faithfully preparing the answer to her needs at every step of the way. First, he sent her to Elizabeth, but then he spoke to Joseph. And then as we continue through the story, we see that God didn't stop there. So Joseph accepted her and said, you know, God, God spoke to Joseph and said, take Mary as your wife. Don't be afraid. Take her as your wife. And he did. But things didn't really get better. Okay, so that was, that was amazing and that was a major help for Mary. But then they still had to travel across, the, you know, miles and miles and miles for a census. And it was really dangerous, actually, to travel that pregnant. Anything could have happened. And so it still took a lot of faith to go, well, Lord, I hope you know what you're doing because I have no idea what you're doing. And, and then what did God provide when they got there? He was thinking ahead. He had the stable provided. I mean, it's not what we would hope. But 
that's what he provided. And then not only when she had the baby in the stable, but God also provided somebody to come and celebrate them. God provided, he spoke to the shepherds and the shepherds came and they celebrated the new birth. And then the wise men. And the wise men brought gifts that I'm sure provided many years of diapers. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> uh, and their life in Egypt. Then, then when they had to go to Egypt, God provided a place for them there. Every single step of the way. I mean, so many times Mary would have had to come face to face with the impossible. Like, again? <laughs> yeah, I know you provided this, but now I'm here. How are you going to provide for this now? And then, wow, God provided again. And then it's like, <laughs> Yes, God, we're here again. We need another miracle. Um, this thing that you said is a blessing doesn't feel like a blessing again. And then God provided again and again and again and again. But none of these provisions could they see ahead of time. Not even one. None of them could be fathomed ahead of time. They, when they were thinking in their mind, like you and I do all the time, Okay, what's our best case scenario? What's our best course of action here? What should we do? What's the best case? Well, let's plan A is this. And if that doesn't work, none of them were in the plans. The way God provided, they could not see ahead of time. Nothing. They saw nothing. And sometimes we look at this story of Mary and we think, wow, what a blessed woman. But we can forget the complexity that she sat in in the moment. And it's so similar in some ways to the complexity we find ourselves in time and time again, thinking, I don't see how this is a blessing. I don't see how this thing in my life is a blessing. You know, I feel like I've gone the wrong way. <laughs> and we forget, you know, in the, in the whole story of Mary, the Christmas story, how complex that really was in the moment. And this is what I really want to leave with you today, is this statement. And, and you've got to think about it for a second. God sent the greatest solution for all mankind in the form of a problem for Mary. The biggest solution, the reason you and I are sitting in this room right now it's because Mary said yes. It's like the, the most amazing thing that happened since the creation of the world was introduced to Mary as a big problem for her. So sometimes when we're going through our lives and we face something and we're thinking, holy cow, this is a big problem. I didn't expect this. I don't know whether it's work, whether it's relationship, whether it's anything in your life that you look at and you go, this is big. I don't think I can handle this. This is the impossible. You know, think back to Mary. God's perfect plan. This was not like God going, oops, okay, well, let me try and let me try and redeem that. No, this was all part of his plan. But to Mary, it was a problem. It was like, okay, I'm just gonna say yes, because that's I just trust you, but I don't see how you're gonna do this. You know, what is it that you're carrying? Could it be that in your situation, in your problem, that there is provision all along the line in front of you. You don't have to come up with the six ways that God might provide for me. Because most of the time, He doesn't choose those six ways. I, I, I mean, we live as missionaries across the world and I'm always like, okay, Lord, we need funding for this. Now I'm gonna do this and hopefully this happens. And you ask my husband, it never, God never ever provides the way we plan. So we still plan and we still do our best the way we all need to do. We still need to plan. We still need to, to do our part. But usually God has something that we weren't planning, that we, weren't, we didn't even think about. 
and His provision continually pops up in our lives. When we choose to surrender to Him and be like, okay, do your thing then. I guess I'm your servant. (laughs) Could it be that in your case, humility means saying yes to the call? Even though you don't have step number two, three, four, 10, 20 figured out. Just saying yes. I don't don't know what step number two is, but step number one is just yes. Agreeing in humility, saying, I am who you say I am. If you call me, then I guess that's who I am. We have uh, um, our associate pastors in Thailand. About two years ago, I think, they had they had put a lot of money and effort and and just raised a lot of support um, to open a children's home in Thailand. Beautiful home. Everything was just great. And um, they had children in the home and something wasn't sitting with them. They're American missionaries. And they they prayed and talked to their pastors and they just said they just felt like this is not what we're supposed to be doing right now. We, I don't know why. This seems like a good thing. You know, looking after children from the community who don't have the assistance of their parents. It seems like such a good thing. But for them, they were just like, God is calling us to do something different. And we need to close this home. How are we going to tell our supporters? How are we going to tell our church? What are we going to say to the community? What are we going to say to the kids in the home who have now depended on this? Like, God, this this is not, how can this be you? This is confusing and disturbing. And they just felt like, uh, we don't know what the next step is, but we feel God is leading us to close this. They didn't feel like God was sending them back to the States. They just feel like God was telling them to, this is the time to close the home. And I remember we were talking with them. They were members of our church at the time, and they were just really broken up about it. And we just told them, you just, just got to, like what I'm sharing, you just got to trust. If this is what God is telling you to do, you don't have to figure out step two, three, four, five. How is everything? You don't need to manage that. If it's God, God's going to provide. God's going to create, <laughs> God's going to create um, something out of this chaos. God's going to create some uh, clarity out of the chaos. And they did. They closed it. And I think they went through about three to four months where they just were not really sure what they were doing. They started serving in the community. And um, their community work just started to explode, really. Um, the, The work that they were doing with kids in the community, not in their home, just started to really grow. And, and they just started to think, you know, this is, this is right, but it's not all. And then actually, um, God started speaking to us about asking them, what did they think about coming on pastoral staff with us? And we watched their lives completely turn around from that time. They are now actually leading our church while we're gone, which is amazing because we never thought that three years after we, you know, had launched into that church that we would have a team and a staff and associate pastors who would lead phenomenally like they did a great job I'm like do we even need to come back like <laughs> but we will we will. we promise that we will so we come back <laughs> but we watched God move in their lives in such an incredible way and now they will tell you this is phenomenal this is amazing we've partnered with them as a church in their community work and it has answered a massive need for both of us they needed volunteers. We needed outreach. We, I, we are, I don't know, but um, as pastors and, and we're, we're doing children's ministry, youth ministry, we lead a lot of areas in the church and we couldn't add outreach. And people would come and tell us, well, if you don't do outreach, your church isn't going to grow. <laughs> and we're like, well, I hear how that works. But if we do outreach, we're going to die. <laughs> like we're going we're gonna to be so burnt out. So God has to provide somehow. And when they came in, we said, you know, we're going to start feeding you people. So people who wanted to be involved in outreach, we just said, 
connect with them. And now it's such a massive outreach they have going. Not just that it's massive, it is so fruitful. They're in a number of communities in Thailand and God has just changed everything around. They are so fruitful. As, as a couple, they are very, very fruitful right now. And that came through saying yes in a very, very difficult, confusing, and disturbing time where nothing made sense. You can look in the Bible and you can see that happen so many times. If you're at a point where you're saying, you know, this is not a blessing. I'm in a place, that, I'm in a set of circumstances that is not a blessing. I encourage you to look through the Bible and, and you're going to start to find so many situations where you're like, no, that did not seem like a blessing. Think about Abraham and Isaac. God asked Abraham to sacrifice his own son that he'd waited a hundred years for. Sure, God, I'm your servant. Like, I mean, I say it sarcastically, but he actually said it. I'm like, I couldn't do that. My son is very glad that I couldn't do that. He's sitting on the front row like, thank God my mom wouldn't, you know. No, I, 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 I'm pretty sure I would wrestle with God on that one. I mean, I love God, but I... You know, but let's just, let's hope it never comes to that. <laughs> but God never, he never showed us the whole future before he asked us to do something difficult. He never showed Mary every single detail that he was going to provide and work it out before he asked her to do something incredibly difficult. And just like Mary, we won't be able to predict the future. We can't predict the future. And the temptation to pull back and go, you know what? I know that I feel like God is wanting me to do this, but that is not safe. The temptation to pull back because it's just not safe or smart is very real. And I'm not saying go and do something stupid. All I'm saying is that when you find yourself face to face with impossible, don't forget that God sent something impossible, a situation that was impossible that eventually saved all of mankind. And don't ever underestimate what he can do through your confused and disturbed situation like he did for Mary. You know, your greatest problem can give way to your destiny when you surrender, when you say yes to God's call on your life. So I'm just going to ask you to stand now. I um, finished here with my sermon, but I just want to pray for you guys today, if that's okay. And I just want to pray for this church. You know, this church has so much history with me. I'm so pumped to be here right now. I'm just so pumped to be here. And I really believe that God has something incredible in store for this church. There's no question about it. You know, we... When we were first in Thailand, sometimes it's not what you expect either. When we were first in Thailand, we didn't even plan to open a church. We didn't know why God sent us back there, but we just thought, you know what, God sent us back, we'll just go. So we went back and then people started coming to us who weren't going to church. And they said, are you guys planning a church? We said, no, no, I don't think so. And they said, well, if you do, we're coming. And there's a number of people who did that, and they had no home church. They weren't going to church. So we said, well, we're not going to have a church, but why don't you guys come over on Sundays, and we'll just worship in the house. You know, and, and, and so we would just worship together and build each other up. Uh, and that progressed into us opening a small church. And um, I think for about two years or so, that church, it didn't really grow much. We were about 40 to 50 people on average, maybe 30 even. Yeah, 30, 40 people on average. Um, but then God actually put us into, like we were connected with a church that had a split. And it was really tragic. And our mentors were left holding the, the pieces because they had given the church away. They, they were quite elderly already. They'd given the church away many years ago. But when it split, they were the only ones who could come back and help pull the pieces together. And it was just so heavy for them that our hearts went out to them. We said, we, we want to do everything that we can to help you. And as time progressed, 
it just became clear that God was doing something between our two churches. We were kind of between two churches at that point. And then God brought us together. The two, we had two campuses at one point. Um, our mentors then asked us if we would take on the church, which we, again, it was an impossible thing. It was like, we're already pastors here. How are we going to be pastors there? But God, again, moved. He just moved. Um, and now, I mean, when we started, the church was, it was at its last leg. It was on its last thread. Um, I think there was about 40 or 50 people there. And um, what happened was, you know, as we just came in and, and shared vision and, and brought people together, God just moved. It wasn't us. It wasn't somehow, you know, something amazing we did. It was just God in his provision and his timing. And now the church is doing incredibly well. Um, and we now have, I mean, God provided a building for us on the main road going through the main city. And, and we usually have about 130 now on, on a Sunday morning. And, and I'm just like, God, wow. Like, how can you, I could have never put the pieces together. I could have never connected the dots. Never. I, I mean, even trying, I would have never connected those dots and said, that's how God's going to bless. And I think it's the same for this church. Don't try and, and process or fathom, how's God going to connect the dots? What you need to do is you need to understand who you are at your heart. In, in the heart of the church, who are you? And as long as you stay to that, you stick to that, I believe that God's going to do something incredible with this church. It doesn't have to be in your timeline. It doesn't have to be according to your plan and your timeline. But as long as you stay faithful and you continue to say yes as a church, I believe God is going to do amazing things. It doesn't have anything to do with the history. History is, is the past. God has a plan. And, and I believe that God's going to do that in this church. So I'm just going to pray for you guys. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for each and every person who's here today and who's watching online. Lord, I just pray that no matter what they're going through in their life, as they look at their life and they go, I'm facing this impossible situation, this impossible set of circumstances. Lord, I pray that you would give them the ability to look at it in your light. That as they have a choice to make, is this a curse or can, can I see this as a curse or a blessing? That they would choose to see it as a blessing. Somehow, some way, this is a blessing and this will be a blessing. Well, we just pray that as a church, Father God, that they would be able to provide community towards each other. That when you're asking them to step out in a way or, or when they're facing a set of circumstances that feels impossible, that they would be able to run to each other and find the encouragement. They wouldn't find sympathy. This is not a sympathy church. But they would find the encouragement and the push to say, yes, I feel it in my spirit. God is moving. God is working. And we're going to stand with you. And Lord, I just want to pray over this church right now, Lord God. God, we thank you that it has a rich future. Lord, we just thank you for the vision that you've put in Pastor Dustin and Beth's heart, Lord God. And God, that there is such an incredible future awaiting, Lord God. That they're just at the early beginnings. And God, they may not be able to connect. I guarantee you they can't connect the dots. But you have such a plan. You have such a purpose. And all we know is at the end result that your kingdom is going to come and your will is going to be done. So right now, I just thank you that we would have a heart of surrender to you to say, have your way. Do it your way. If it's hard, it's hard. But that there would just be such a surrender to the way you do things, Lord. We just thank you for the people that you're going to be bringing into this church that are going to fill those key roles in Jesus' name. We thank you that, that wherever there's a lack, where there's a gap, that God, you're, you have hand-picked people that will come and be able to serve that gap. That God, maybe they're here right now, 
Maybe they're young. Maybe they're not young anymore. But God, you're go- you have a way of bringing them out, Lord God, that every single chair that needs to be filled in this place will be filled. That every pillar that needs to be standing in this church will be standing in Jesus' name. We just call them in in Jesus' name. Lord, we just thank you for your blessing upon this place. That this place is blessed and this place will be a blessing in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.